So he's doing a search and like this almond grower with a Palo Alto address pops up. He's like, what the hell? This, this can't be right. So he goes and interviews him and it happens to be the same LP who I was very close with. And uh, he says, hey, I'm doing this eBay for almonds, but like it's not working. I'm not getting good traction. And I'm thinking about this path and it was somewhat similar to what I was doing. So um, he made the introduction. This is back in 2017 and you know, love at first sight. Uh, we just sort of hit it off. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the contemplating that I had done previously, you know, the gut check was there, and um, mm -hmm. hence the genesis of, of Gold Leaf. This is Durable Value. Get investing and business insights from industry experts and successful entrepreneurs every week. Like and subscribe now. So today uh, for our episode, we're here to speak with you, Brandon Ribeiro, uh, co-founder and head of farming for Gold Leaf Ag. And ultimately, our goal today is really to get a sense of the world of ag investing, agricultural investing. Um, it's not something that we're personally familiar with, uh, but there are a lot of overlaps in private equity real estate investing and agricultural investing. And I'd love to be able to, um, you know, for our listeners to be able to get a better understanding of what it is you guys do and also um, how they should be looking at agriculture investing when it comes to their whole portfolio. Uh, but before we launch in, I'd love if you could just give us a little bit of background on you and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, honored to be a guest. Uh, I grew up here in Modesto and uh, went to Modesto High, uh, later went to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Grew up on a small uh, almond orchard. It was my grandpa's 30 acres and, uh, you know, loved almond farming at a young age, loved getting dirty, driving tractor getting blisters, you know, all the fun stuff as a kid, and always dreamed of being a farmer, a full-time farmer. And then, you know, about eighth grade, my dreams were shattered when I learned you couldn't make a living off of 30 acres of almonds. You know, that was like, <laughs> oh man, uh, total buzzkill. So basically what I did is uh, throughout high school, I worked for a lot of the neighboring large farmers. A lot of my classmates in grade school and high school, their families were large farmers. So I would work for them and sort of learned like, you know, basic operations, equipment operations. Um, and basically, I'd say one big takeaway of that was like uh, real appreciation for the culture of labor and the workers. Mm -hmm. um, got to know what, them. What do you mean by that? Well, like their strifes, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, mm -hmm. what they go through every day and, um, you know, not understanding that culture previously and then uh, sort of rubbing elbows with them at lunch, mm -hmm. you know, like literally sitting on our buckets in the shop and like, you know, I'm eating my sandwich, they're eating their lunches and I don't always understand what they're saying, but like we just really bonded on a whole different level. Yeah. And that always stuck with me. Um, so I went on to college and started uh, studying agronomy and the plant sciences, um, had a real interest in that and came back and uh, was an agronomy consultant. Um, consulted for lots of acres of tree nuts in California, pistachios and, and almonds, and then later started a farm management company. Mm -hmm. It's kind of uh, the norm in the industry is you have an agronomist. If you're a grower, you have your agronomist as your advisor, and then you have like a farm management company, and they're usually different companies. So I saw an opportunity to merge those, um, so to consult and then execute, um, sort of like, you know, the spotter, the sniper, I wanted yep. to take the shots. Yep. So that was like my first bridge into that. Um, and then uh, I came back and we got the business off the ground, the consulting and the, the farm management. It was about that time when one of the first private equity firms in the space came to San Luis County and started developing almonds. Um, so they had an agenda to deploy quite a bit into uh, Greenfield, raw land developments, and we developed about 10,000 acres in eight years wow. from Oakdale all the way up to Davis, California. Mm -hmm. And that was about an eight year sprint. They were bootstrapped. Um, you know, they raised money from high net worth capital. And then basically at the end of that life, they exited to a Canadian pension. During that time, I was kind of learning their playbook. I knew the farm side well, and I was really interested in the investment side, but just didn't have the acumen. So I was exposed to it. And uh, at Exit, they offered me an opportunity to come on board with them as a partner, a junior partner. And I ultimately declined just for personal reasons. It just, quite frankly, didn't feel right in my gut. 
Mm-hmm. I just wasn't feeling it. Um, so uh, there was a pivot away from that, and I had developed some good relationships with the original LPs in this this fund, mm-hmm. uh, who were the original investors. Like I would be the guy, uh, they'd jump in my truck, yeah, and like I'd show them the orchards. They thought it was cool. They could you know take selfies in front of the trees and like show their buddies they they're invested in orchards. <laughs> great, great people. Like you could have a yeah. beer with you know, like mm-hmm. uh, not you know some stuffy types. Yeah. So when that happened, um, you know, I talked to a few of them, said, hey, here's what I'm thinking. I'm interested in this 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, and they quickly said, well, you need like a good partner uh, mm-hmm. who gets the investment side and the finance side. Mm-hmm. Went down that path, found a partner, and we were two uh, similar skill sets. It wasn't complimentary enough. So um, it was sort of like about ready to tap out. It wasn't going anywhere. And then um, one of the original LPs who I was close with said, hey, you got to get over here to Palo Alto and meet this guy, Jack. And it turns out uh, Jack was at GSB Business School at Stanford. Mm-hmm. And he was working on an eBay for almonds. And part of the, his like thesis was to interview entrepreneurs in Palo Alto, but also like just almond growers. So he's doing a search and like this almond grower with a Palo Alto address pops up. He's like, what the hell? This, this can't be right. <laughs> So he goes and interviews him, and it happens to be the same LP who I was very close with. Mm-hmm. And uh, he says, hey, I'm doing this eBay for almonds, but like it's not working, I'm not getting good traction. And I'm thinking about this path, and it was somewhat similar to what I was doing. So mm-hmm. um, he made the introduction. This is back in 2017, and you know, love at first sight. Uh, we just sort of hit it <laughs> off. Yeah. Um, all the contemplating I had done previously, you know, the gut check was there, and um, mm-hmm. hence the genesis of, of Goldleaf. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, you you said, uh, you know, a match at first sight between you as partners. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because, uh, you know, having a partnership in a business is its own thing. Uh, yeah. Joe and I uh, have that partnership and, you know, we certainly look at the strengths that that partnership brings. But I'd love to hear, you know, when you're first meeting that potential business partner, you know, what are, what are the thoughts going through your mind and, and what made you feel like it was the right fit? Totally. Like, you know, as much as I'd love to say there's this quantitative analysis and this box checking, it was trust. Yeah. It was like the gut check was, was there. Um, I just felt it. And uh, once like the dust settled and like the gut check was there, we realized our skill sets were very complementary. Um, you know, Jack comes from... Uh, TPG and McKinsey, you know, uh, consulting and private equity investing. And I come from like large scale farming operations, very opposite, Mm -hmm. very different perspectives. Um, But that really like solved for the gap in Mm -hmm. our in our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was tactical and then it was more trust than anything. Um, And that sort of continues throughout, you know, the gold leaf story are different views. And we have very healthy tension, you know, uh, because we have different perspectives. And We don't avoid the tough conversations um, because our worlds are very different from one another. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, Very similar. Um, So maybe just backing up a little bit, you gave kind of the high level on your background and how you got to here. Uh, Tell me about a a time or experience or, or something in your past that maybe was a challenge, but was formative in how you view the world or how you run the business or whatever the case may be. Totally. Good question. I would say in the early days, you know, like I was pretty envious of my classmates who were sort of born into large farming operations and just, you know, like, man, I wish that were me sort of thing. Cause mm-hmm. farming obviously is one of those things you don't just like get into. It's, it takes generations to build up any sort of portfolio that you can make a living off of. So um, I was really motivated early on to like, I'm gonna have to do this myself or I'm not gonna do it. Like there's no simple solve. Yeah. So uh, I also, um, you know, didn't appreciate how I saw a lot of the labor force being treated, quite frankly, um, just sort of undervalued. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that bothered me. And um, I wanted a chance to like, change the world in whatever small way I could. Didn't realize those exact words at the time, but like looking back, that's what I was really solving for. So I would say like sort of being the underdog and uh, not like, you know, the 10th generation grower 
that sort of thing. Like wish I could have, but as I look back, I no longer wish I could have because it really, you know, those battle scars and that sort of uh, grind is what helped me see a lot of, uh, you know, tough situations, how to solve them. So I would say it was that like just drive to want to farm basically full time as mm -hmm. a living mm -hmm. and then uh, finding the right path to like get there. And I tried that in a few different avenues and it wasn't until, you know, the stars aligned that Jack and I met and realized this yeah. is a good fit. That's great. Yeah. So uh, your business, you said 2017? 2017, 2017 when you started. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, when you guys first started, what type of investments were you looking for? How did you assemble your capital? Um, and uh, I'd love to understand that in the context of ag investing in particular. Sure. So I, I guess broadly speaking, like we want to be in supply constrained crops. We don't mm -hmm. want to be in, you know, commoditized crops that are traded on the boards of exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, we were pretty quickly focused on almonds. You know, 80 plus percent of the world's almonds are grown in California. Um, so, you know, we, we want to be in businesses where demand continues to outstrip supply. Mm -hmm. um, so pistachios would be another uh, crop that we're in, almonds, pistachios. And our views would be like an inch wide and a mile deep. Just be true experts in our crops before mm -hmm. we move to any tertiary crops. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're getting really good at the almond, the pistachios. We think we have a really good playbook and a good team. Uh, an example of a tertiary crop would be dates. So dates also supply constrained. Mm. Um, they have really unique climactic requirements similar to almonds and pistachios. So, you know, we have a 40 acre date farm down south of Coachella um, in Bard. No one's ever heard of Bard, but it's somewhere <laughs> between Yuma and Coachella. And uh, it's very hot. There's a music festival in Coachella. <laughs> yeah, that's what everyone thinks. That's why I throw out Coachella, not Bard. It's yeah, exactly. way cooler. Uh, so basically, you know, that's an example. We want to get really good in that business before we expand. We've had that holding for maybe three years now. Mm -hmm. And until we have ultra confidence, we're not going to deploy anymore into the, the date space. Um, our capital base, so we just had our five-year anniversary and uh, we were kind of reflecting on, you know, since 2017, our capital base continues to be mainly high net worth mm -hmm. individuals and um, some family office money, mm -hmm. but the bulk is um, high net worth. In the early days in 2017, uh, GLF1, our first deal, we're now like at GLF28. Oh, wow. We're not very creative with our namings here, you know? <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, we, it was 132 acre almond orchard. Um, that looks like, you know, maybe 5 million uh, of equity. And uh, so year one, GLF one, 100, 132 acres. And then we just were reflecting GLF 28. Um, we're at about 12,000 acres at year end. We'll be at around 12,000 acres and about 220 million um, of equity raised. Wow. Um, so the, the growth has been good. I would say with that comes a lot of growing pains. Mm -hmm. You know, like I would admit we are behind on hiring mm -hmm. um, and we're playing catch up there mm -hmm. um, on the farm side and probably on the business team side. Um, growth is just outpacing our infrastructure. So we're playing catch up on the hiring. So uh, how do you identify that uh, as, as a problem in the first place and how are you solving for it? Yeah, good question. So uh, we operate on EOS, which I think you guys yeah. do, Entrepreneurs yep. Operating System. Yep. And uh, it really helped us identify the blind spots. Um, as you know, there's like an RPS chart, um, vision traction organizer. Yep. By the way, I'm not getting royalties for selling these EOS books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, but like it was game changing for our business. Yeah. It really helped Same us here. just have yep. like a dashboard um, and make sure like we're firing on all cylinders and we have the right people in the right seats. Mm -hmm. So when we did that full assessment, we realized um, we had a lot of the right people, but we had the right people in the wrong seats. Mm -hmm. So once we had that sort of charted out, we realized, okay, where are the gaps here? Mm -hmm. What changes do we need to make? Mm -hmm. Who do we need to hire? So we had a clear plan forward of move these folks here. It's going to align with their wants and their yeah. passions. Yeah. And most of the time when we move someone, they were really like their quality of life was much better after yeah. that yeah. Um, is what we found. It wasn't like as hard of a conversation as we thought. It was more of a relief. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I would say we realized with that, like the need for hiring, it was just very obvious where yeah. we needed to hire. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your investing. 
um, how do you look at a new investment? A new deal comes along. What are you looking for? What type of investments are you looking for? And then what does execution strategy look like on an agricultural investment? Yeah, sure. So we have, uh, we spent a lot of time in, you know, researching the whole state and we have a pretty comprehensive map. It's an interactive, interactive map with all these different layers. Some of the layers are like yield. So we know which areas are yielding better than others. Interesting. Um, it's taken us years to collect this data. Uh, we also have uh, an overlay of water districts. So where's the good water? Where do we want to be investing? Mm -hmm. We have another overlay for climate. Um, perennial crops like almonds and pistachios have a chill requirement. That just means it needs to be this many hours of cold temps during the winter. And with climate change, like that's, that becomes a real consideration. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a pretty like data-driven approach to where we're going. It's not by any means a shotgun. Um, once we identify an area, uh, there's two paths. One is, you know, broker outreach. Uh, so we, I'd say we're like on the good list for most brokers because we can give a quick yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think more importantly is like, can you say no quick so you don't waste people's time. Yeah. Yeah. And when we commit, you know, we, we always close. Yeah. So I'm sure it's similar in, in yeah. your space. Yeah. And so we've got, I think, pretty good, uh, you know, reputation uh, for being able to close deals. Once the deal's identified, let me back up. So one path is sourced through brokers. The other path, what I'm starting to spend more time on is deal outreach. So going to potential off-market deals, mm -hmm. just in my network of growers mm -hmm. uh, in the industry, once we have these areas identified, um, sort of 80-20 rule, yep. canvas like the highest target areas, and then I'll personally reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Not with a cold email, but like literally a visit to their doorstep or a phone call and yep. try to set up lunch. Um, so that's our path to deal flow. Once we see something we like and we get it in a contract, pretty lengthy diligence process, but the, the real takeaway is we want to be uh, a, the lowest cost producer. So right now almonds are in a, a trough in 20 year pricing. Oh, got it. And that's really like, you know, exposing people who are either over leveraged or, uh, just expensive operators and two ways to do that, have a low cost structure and have high yields. Mm -hmm. So first thing we do is focus, where's the yield at? And then where's the lowest cost structure? The biggest variable in cost structure is water cost. Okay. So we do have areas um, that are very high yielding, but the water's expensive. So the cost structure uh, imbalance is, you know, not a good situation to be in. And we've since learned from that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a not so good situation that we've learned from and we're getting back on course, but um, I would say from that takeaway, it was be the low cost producer. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, we identify the asset. I lead the farming diligence process. That's all, you know, soils, tissue, tissues like leaves, leaf samples, okay. uh, water samples, um, meet with the operator, full diagnostic of the orchard, walking through it, meet with the operators. Um, and then on the asset side, it's, you know, a lot of legal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's debt raising, um, figuring out the pro forma, and then, uh, you know, are we going to hit our target uh, IRR um, and cash on cash? And, and uh, you know, what sort of strategies do you guys deploy on your properties? Are you looking for, you know, what we call heavy value add, or are you looking more for kind of stabilized cash flowing with incremental improvements? No. Do you guys develop from the ground up orchards? Yeah, combination of all the above, but I would say uh, we don't view ourselves as turnaround specialists. So we can't add a ton of new value to an orchard in terms of like boosting yields. Mm -hmm. There's a saying like in the wine industry, right? Like the best winemaker in the world can't make good wine out of bad grapes. Mm -hmm. Like if the vineyards in Modesto versus Napa, yeah, right? It doesn't yeah. matter who the winemaker is, yeah. the grapes out of Napa are gonna make better yeah. wine. Yeah. It's true with orchards too. So um, certain things are fixed like soils and climate. Mm -hmm. biggest drivers of yield. Doesn't matter how good we are as operators. Um, if we know the historical yields, so in that example, we would step into an existing orchard. Uh, we'd look at historical yields and then I would sort of decipher all this data and say, I think we can stabilize here for the long haul. Yep. And we do a low case, a base case, and a yep. high case scenario yep. for yield. Yep. Um, and then that's really like the driver of its entry price and its yield and its OPEX. Got it. Um, yield probably moves 
IR and cash on cash the most. Got it. So I'd say our like down the middle of the fairway deals are cash flowing deals, annual cash flow. Um, and you know, we model an exit, terminal exit value uh, for IRR purposes, but um, Jack and I are both in our 30s. Oh, I just turned 40. I gotta correct myself <laughs> here. Uh, so we intend to do it for life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but as fiduciaries, if someone came with, you know, some crazy thing, we have to consider yeah. that, but that's yeah. really not part of our business plan now. Got it. Greenfield developments, uh, and in ag we call it open ground developments. We do those um, not as frequently, just because the payback period is a little bit painful. Mm -hmm. uh, when some of our investors come from real estate and they're used to the annual distributions, um, like you guys do, uh, that's a little bit different. However, we are dabbling in opportunity zones, oh, which is pretty nuanced for ag. And I would say like we're probably leading the charge on that. We don't see a lot of other uh, competitors in that space. But um, I know real estate, you know, there's a similar play there. We find a little bit more opportunity because areas we already operate in um, tend to be like lower income, yeah. impoverished communities, yeah. already identified as opportunity zones. So uh, those are attractive uh, to investors who normally would not invest in a long-term hold development mm -hmm. deal because mm -hmm. their capital is tied up for long. But, um, you know, as you know, and uh, some of your listeners might know is basically Mr. Investor, you know, can sell his Tesla stock and then roll the gains into yep. this deal tax free. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, you know, there's some catch up down the road. But that tends to be like our focus on developments unless we have a super strategic entry price. The main reason we don't do developments, though, is the entry price is uh, pretty high. So they're kind of pricing in yeah, the upside exactly. in the purchase price. Yeah. Yeah. And the market is really inefficient. So what I mean by that is like it's more comp based than value based and mm -hmm. cash flow based. Mm -hmm. So the average grower, and I grew up in a farming community, if your neighbor got thirty thousand dollars an acre, by God, you want thirty thousand acre for yours. Yeah. He might be yielding, you know, three thousand pounds an acre and spitting out ten percent cash on yeah. cash every year. The other guy might be yielding 2,500 pounds an acre and yielding 5% cash on cash. Yeah. Most of the time, they'll sell for the exact same price. <laughs> so that hurts us and it helps us. Where yeah. it helps us on the sourcing side is um, if, a yield, if an orchard's very high yielding, yeah. we know we can pay more for it. Yeah. And the other guy's likely to think that's just overpriced based on comps. Yeah. But we know it kicks out enough cash flow to hit our thresholds. Yeah. So we're very competitive there. Where it hurts us is when we would just want like a down the middle of the fairway, easy deal, good water district, uh, yields tend to be a little bit lower in some cases, we can't overpay and we'll, we'll just never overpay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's sort of like, you know, our go to market and how we'd run a deal to ground. And then I guess fundraising would kick off after that. So the yeah. diligence passes the sniff test and then um, we, and so you fundraise per deal. We do. Good question. So yeah. like we're a, a you know fund of one, mm -hmm. if you will. And so GLF one through twenty eight is twenty eight different LLCs, <laughs> which you know um, is is not easy to manage. Yeah. But one thing we like about it is versus the fund model, which is uh, what we've also talked about doing, getting started in the early days. The deal of one was really important because we had to build trust yep. and track record. Yep. It was much easier to say, Mr. Investor, here's the PowerPoint deck of the orchard. Here's the pro forma, PPM. Here's pictures. Here's the assumptions. Here's the location. Do you want to go look at it? So yeah. they there was more buy-in. Yeah. They knew what they were getting into, yeah. and that sort of built trust. You know, maybe down the road, um, as we get more track track record and uh, more credibility and uh, consistent performance. Yep. I think the fund model, you know, is something to talk more about because um, then people sort of know what they're getting into. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting because I also heard from you that it sounds like it's more of a maybe not a perpetual life thing, but investors going into these investments, they're, it sounds like you're saying they're driven by cash yield and knowing that they kind of have a durable long-term cash yield, not some sort of a big exit. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, our investors are all tax paying. So mm -hmm. it'd be a real problem if we uh, said we're going to hold for 20 years and we exit in year five. Yep. Then they have they have the problem of redeploying. Yep. They have a tax problem, right? Yep. All sorts yep. of problems. So 
our view is like uh, you know protect the capital at all cost, and it's like a long it's a long term hold, yeah. uh, steady return. We're not promising any you know big grand slams or exits. Yeah. Uh, very you know safe uh, safe asset class, and um, we want to you know uh, under promise over deliver. Maybe just kind of concluding, it'd be great to talk a little bit about um, why investors seek agricultural investing. You know what are the characteristics of it. What are the considerations when people are thinking about investing in, in ag? Yeah, so interesting question. We had our first investor conference last year in San Francisco, and it was the first time we got a lot of just general feedback and good questions from the audience. And uh, number one, it's just a very difficult asset class to get access to. Um, you know, if you look at the publicly traded markets, you're going to maybe go to REITs, mm -hmm. uh, big ag REITs, and that's really like a commoditized focus on corn soybeans um, and they do some of them have like an emphasis in tree nuts but it's very broad um, so it's difficult it's a difficult asset class to get into and to invest in okay. and we found there's demand for that yep one other interesting way is like how do you invest in a scarce resource like water everyone would love to invest in water there's real no like investable market one vehicle for that is buying land with very strong water rights and very good water districts and what we're seeing now with, um, you know, the drought taking place in California, um, you know, a lot of people view California doesn't have water. The truth is it's highly fragmented where we have water and where we don't have water. Got it. Um, and so where we're invested and have paid, you know, premiums to be in good water districts, we're seeing healthy appreciation there. These uh, marginal water areas uh, are now, you know, devaluing. So uh, we see that as one interest level of like just water. Um, investment. The other is, um, you know, it's a noble business. We're growing food, a yeah. healthy food yeah. to feed the world. Uh, people like that. Um, I also think, you know, we're converting 70% uh, of our portfolio into organic. Um, oh, wow. and, and our North Star is to leave the world better than we found it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's not only the right thing to do for the environment, but it's a good business decision too. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of, you know, a nascent market right now. And we're gonna, you know, hopefully be the pioneers in, in growing that business. Um, that'll make us easy, like one of the largest organic nut producers in the world, mm -hmm. um, once that all converts over. So that's of interest to, to our investors. Um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of these guys come from real estate, guys and gals come out of the real estate business. So they understand like, uh, hard assets and, and annual cash flow, but this is like a little bit of a diversification for them. Yeah. Um, and we're really like uncorrelated to the S&P. So as a benchmark, if you look, you know, since World War II, like farmland has grown um, incrementally yeah. and uh, really is uncorrelated to the S&P 500 volatility. Um, so it tends to be stable over the long haul. They like that on the macro. And then I guess like, Maybe unlike the people side, uh, we treat our people much differently. Like our starting wage, this is a min minimum wage industry, by the way, Got for it. the most part. We start our people at $20 an hour. They have 100% paid health care. Same health care offered to me and Jack is also offered to them. Uh, they can put their kids on it. We cover it all. Um, you know, retirement, 401k. Um, Jack and I have lunch with all of them once a quarter. We kind of sort of migrate throughout the state in these different hubs and sit yeah. down and have lunch and and listen like to what they're what they're doing. So, um, I'm curious. I, I, that's amazing, by the way. Oh, uh, thanks. Like what you mentioned, lowest cost structure, and then you mentioned uh, starting wages twenty dollars an hour, full benefits in a minimum wage business. I'd love to dig into that because obviously there's a conception. It sounds like in the agriculture industry that you have to be low cost and therefore the only way you can be low cost is by driving your labor costs down yeah how, how have you guys obviously been able to yeah great question that? so like our views to have all a players right a plus players on the bus the right yep. people on the bus you can't offer you know c minus wages and expect a plus players to show up mm -hmm. so what we're finding is uh as we move more and more to technology, we're a very like tech-driven, data-driven farming company, not just back office, but our farming practices are uh, fairly sophisticated from a tech standpoint. It takes smart people mm -hmm. to run that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use less of, of uh, less staff, yep. quite frankly, with 
uh, some automation, but it takes smarter people. Um, so, you know, in order to execute on our organic initiatives and deliver a better return at the end of the day, we need smart people and the right people on the bus. Yeah. Um, so we're willing to pay a premium for that. That also sets the bar much higher. Yep. Um, so when, you know, underperformers see that, oh, the bar's here, they tend to step up their game, which is what we've seen. Yeah. Um, we also get good word of mouth press. Once people hear that, oh, my friend is making 20 bucks at Goldleaf. Yeah. Uh, that sort of like is attractive. Yeah. And it also like maybe the neighboring farmer doesn't like that too much. But as far as like leaving the world better than we found it, yeah. he's going to have to probably raise wages for his yep. folks too to be yep. competitive. So it yep. kind of, you know, gives a lift a bit to the, to the industry. That's awesome. Um, and, you know, and we're proud of that. Um, and I would say, you know, we really, from a cost perspective, labor is like that much of a total budget. Yeah. When you really tear apart yeah. the financials, it's really like inputs like fertility, uh, crop protection, and water. Mm -hmm. Those are the big drivers of uh, cost. So mm -hmm. if I'm gonna go strip out a budget, those yeah. are the big drivers. Yeah. Like, what's yeah. the eighty? What's the twenty percent that can you know yeah. move eighty percent of the needle? Uh, the budget. That's where I focus. Labor's really like, yeah. not huge. And when we raised wages to twenty bucks starting, it was very like um, you know M minimal, very minimal yeah. impact on farm budgets. That's awesome. And retention is much better, right? So, on that note, uh, you know, just kind of closing out, would love to hear uh, what you guys think five years from now or ten years looks like for gold leaf farming. Wow, great question. Uh, Jack and I were reflecting on that a bit recently, and you know, we think there's an obvious path to go vertical. So right now, the way it works is we sell our crops, almonds and pistachios, to a, a processor, and then you know, probably goes to Costco, it goes to Kind Bar, all sorts of folks like that. Um, we see a real opportunity because we're going to be one of the largest organic producers in the space uh, to be able to tell our story. So we're doing a lot of good things for the mm -hmm. environment. Um, that we're just not getting credit for. Mm -hmm. And I think we think the consumers of the future want to know the story of where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. No one's going to tell our story for us, so we have to tell it ourselves. So I think there's an obvious path to vertical, um, having our own branding, labeling, uh, processing side of things. Um, down the road, you know, a lot of wood to chop to, to get there, but um, I think that's a real outcome. I also think like, you know, one of the premier employers in the space uh, kind of leading by example of how to treat people and uh, a place where, man, I want to work there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that really matters to us a lot. And then hopefully like a solid proven track record in five to 10 years of trust and like consistent returns and ultimately delivering on what we're promising. That's great. Well, uh, thank you for your time today, and uh, this has been very beneficial, and uh, hopefully we can talk more in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Durable Value, an investor's podcast, where we demystify commercial real estate with safe, sound investment strategies to help you balance your portfolio. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more, visit grisadapartners.com, where you'll find more information, investor's tools, case studies, and more. This podcast is hosted by Joe Miratori and Ryan Suela. It's produced, edited, and mixed by Melodic, with intro music by Ian Post. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.